right. Well, tonight we're going to take a look at study four. Um, Psalm 9 and 10 and 1 Samuel 17. Um, welcome everyone and to everyone who's at home that watch. Um, we're glad to have you and hope you're blessed through our study. Um, I, someone asked me if I would briefly just go over the studies that are in between. And so I'm just going to take a few minutes just to look at um, Psalm 13, 14, and 24. Um, if you have opportunity to do those additional studies through the week, they're <laughs> such a blessing. But it can be a lot. I understand that. But I'm just going to quickly touch on each one. Um, and if you don't have it with you, it's all right. I'm not, we're, gonna, we're not going to spend a lot of time there because I really want to get to Psalm 9 and 10. Um, but Psalm 13 is an uh, individual lament or a praise. Um, one of the things about this psalms is it says to sum, sum up the psalm in one or two sentences. I would say that it lifts the heart. Um, it's a lament that reaches down to the very bottom when you're feeling very low um, to the end of the age. Um, and ask the question, can I praise God in my weariness in verses 1 to 4? And in five and six, yes. And it's almost like a deep sigh, a restful sigh that you can. You can trust the Lord with your weariness, with your tiredness. Um, it's a beautiful song, a uh, psalm written by David. Psalm 14 is a wisdom, petition, individual, national, messianic enthronement, uh, identified as David as the author, to the chief musician. I say this psalm is looking at the fool who says there is no God in his heart. Um, it's the corruption of the world, corruption of the heart, um, but ultimately just a refusal to reject God and what he's done is what the fool has done. It's not because he doesn't know, it's because he's rejected God. Um, David concludes with a petition that God will bring salvation um, of Israel out of Zion, which is a messianic reference, um, that even though there's so much corruption in the world, even though we're desperately wicked at heart, God will, God does bring salvation. There is hope. Psalm 24 is enthronement, praise, thanksgiving, and wisdom. David being the author, summing up this psalm, um, this is looking at the future kingdom. Uh, he's the chief shepherd in this psalm, which we studied Psalm 23 last week. Psalm 24 goes with it, and it's the chief shepherd. Um, speaks to the sovereignty of God, Jehovah God. He is presented as the possessor of all things. Um, he's the establisher of all things, which every time I see the word established now, I think back to our study of the Song of Moses. Lord, establish us, make us worthy, give us something we can do. And so you see the word establish all over scripture. Uh, the one who is high and lifted up, the mighty warrior, the king of glory, and Lord of hosts. Only those of Jacob or Israel may approach with clean hands and a pure heart. But Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 3, verse 14, that all believers through Jacob and, and Abraham can have that same salvation, can come with a pure heart, um, same ability to approach the Lord of hosts with clean hands. So that's just a quick look at those three psalms in between. Remember this is chronological order, so those fell in between Psalm 23 and what we're going to look at tonight. Okay, with that, our studies, Psalm 9 and 10, 1 Samuel 17. <clears throat> what a wonderful study. Just a brief little uh, thing. Chapter 8, um, we're not studying that tonight, but chapter 8 is looking at the Creator and looking at Christ and what He's done uh, for us, um, making Him a little lower than the angels and coming in human form. And so we see Him that way and it looks um, it's a messianic psalm it's quoted three times in the new testament it's 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 uplifting it's encouraging uh, nine and ten are not as much we're going to begin to begin to look at the corruption of, of the wicked um, 
And so as we look at 9 and 10, and really through 15, 9 through 15 all have the same kind of feel to it. It's the same kind of psalm. Um, we're going to begin to look at the low, the low side of mankind and sin. We'll see a glimpse of the Jewish remnant and their sin, and the lawless one, the Antichrist. We're going to get a better picture of the Antichrist. Chapter 9 gives a picture of the prophetic forecast of what will be, what it will be when the Son of Man is here operating in peace in the kingdom. So 9 is a little more uplifting. 10, um, we get to take a look at the struggle with the prideful man and wickedness, which is compared to Goliath or Pharaoh um, coming out of Egypt, um, which is a small picture of the Antichrist, who is Satan's man. Um, so as we study a little further, we're going to look at God's man versus Satan's man. All right. Um, yeah, in chapter 10, we're going to see that the man of pride hotly pursues the poor, which is terrible. Okay, Psalm 9. With that, what classification or types of psalm is this? Psalm 9. I had it down as an individual, uh, a psalm of thanksgiving. Yep, that's and right. And praise and something else, whatever E was. <laughs> Enthronement? Enthronement, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Those are the ones that I identified this with because he touched on all those areas, I think. Yes. And nine. He did. And that's one of the things about when we do the classifications, you may have something different than someone else because mm -hmm. it's more than just one. A lot of them are. Mm -hmm. So, okay, did anybody have anything else? Any diff anything different? Okay. Um, I had similar Thanksgiving praise petition. Um, okay, who's the author? David. David. Yep. David's the author. And are there any special instructions noted in the title? Yes, to the, well, the New King James said to the choir master according to Moose Laban. Yeah. And the ESV said to the chief musician to the tune of Death of the Sun, which sounds yeah. like a really happy tune. <laughs> <laughs> Not the same right. Yes. The same thing. Yes. yes. Yeah. Good choice. <laughs> Um, yes, and what I was able to study and come up with is that this probably looking like death to Goliath or to Pharaoh in deliverance. It's, it's about deliverance. Because I think what we're going to see in 9 and 10 is deliverance from the evil one. That's the theme. And so when we studied 1 Samuel 17, of course we're looking at Goliath, I think we could have studied even them coming out of Egypt um, with Moses and Pharaoh, same kind of, same kind of feel. So, okay, anybody else? My uh, study Bible that I use said that uh, David praised God for executing judgment, and he incited mm -hmm. others to do the same. Yes, yes. Well, that's how it opens the first two or three verses. Um, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. Yep, that is definitely how it opens in this psalm. Okay? Anybody else? No, I'm scratching. Okay, Jamie, if you start moving around, I'm going to think you're going to share something. I know. <laughs> okay, Psalm 10. What classification or types of psalm is this? It's an individual lament, a national lament, a petition. Mm hmm. Yep. Okay. That's what I have too. Anybody have anything else? It's pretty much a lament. Pretty much a what? A lament. 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 Uh huh. National individual lament. Okay. And note the author if identified, which we it doesn't identify it, but. We know it's David. Mm -hmm. Yeah. David. Yes. Okay. I know it's David. Tradition. I was going to say mostly because it it's the same style of writing. It falls within the same time period. 
Um, so, Jamie. They say that uh, originally nine and ten were together in one. Mm -hmm. Yes, because it is acrostic from the Hebrew alphabet, nine and ten together. But not all of the letters of the alphabet are there. But according to the Vulgate and the Septuagint, um, it had it. Yes, so, yeah. Complicated, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Um, okay. So let's sum up the possible. Poss let's see. Sum up the possible. Nah, sum up the possible <laughs> historical context in a few sentences for Samuel 17. <coughs> Who would like to tackle that one? <laughs> and you can turn to First Samuel because we're going to look at it a little bit. First Samuel 17. Yes. Yep. David Clue. was in his youth at the time, still tending his father's sheep occasionally. Um, in God's plan, Jesse sent him to the battlefield to see how his three elder brothers fared and put him in the place of God's plan for David to confront Goliath. Which, when you try to imagine that, and then here comes this, you know, you just, I picture him as just a, you know, a ruddy teenager. Yeah. And yet he's like, what's the matter with you people? I know. And I could just see him thinking, oh, I think they're indispensable. Or, you know, <laughs> and you could just feel the criticism, especially from his elder brother. Yes. But um, what, a, what mature things he said in Do We Not Have a Cause? And defying our the God, our living God, and challenging their uh, faithlessness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sally. Well, I thought that, um, I mean, Goliath taunted them for 40 days, every day, day and night, it said he would come out there and say this malarkey to them, and they would be quaking in their boots, and none of them thought to turn to God until this yeah. young man, teenager probably, like you say, came along and um, said, what's up guys, you know, <laughs> right. I, I can imagine just his amazement that they hadn't thought to, you know, mm -hmm. ask God. And Had no confidence, no confidence in the Lord absolutely. as yeah. God's army. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I was struck with, with what she said, with David's God confidence, mm -hmm. that when Saul said, here's the armor, use this, wear this, Helmet, do all this, and he found that that wasn't his his strong suit, and he oh. said to Saul, "You know, I yes. I killed the lion, I killed the bear, or whatever. I, this is what I'm going to do with my bag and my sap and my. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put the stones in it, and this is how I yep. how I roll. That's right. This is how I roll. <laughs> right, right. Anybody else? I thought the Philistines could have attacked Israel and killed them any time, yeah. but they enjoyed taunting them. Yeah, exactly. It was part of what they did. I think it definitely speaks to the pride that we're going to see in chapter 10. The pride that they had, and the pride was their downfall. Okay. Anybody else? Kristen. Um, at the end of the chapter, um, Saul is asking, who is this boy? Who was he? Where did he come from? So is this before David was ministering to Saul and playing tunes and things for him? It was after. after. So you how tormented he was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you didn't know who he was. You didn't know he was. Mm -hmm. I think he probably didn't take David seriously. Mm -hmm. And when David defeated Goliath, it was a whole new ball game. Well, it was really about learning who his father was because that was part of the reward. Yeah. Which was like, put no taxes into that, something. And he would marry, yeah. he'd marry yeah. Saul's yeah. daughter, yeah. and then he would be tax free. When I but looked at this have story. A short memory because he did. <laughs> well, I mean, he was. That's yeah. True. That's true. Yes. I guess so, because. He yes. called for David to come play the harp. Yeah, on. he did. And David came to the battlefield, it says, quite a bit. I want to kind of walk through the story for just a minute. If you'll turn to chapter 17. In the beginning, we see now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. 
and they were encamped on mountains, which mountains like Ozark Mountains, and there's a valley in between. Um, and we see that in verse 9 that Goliath was tall, he was big, he was their champion, um, and it talks about all of his armor and all of that. Um, in 9, in verse 8, he stood and shouted and taunted, like Sally was saying, and um, Katie, taunting to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw, draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. Um, verse 16, for 40 days the Philistines came forward and took his stand morning and evening, just continually mocking and making fun of them. Um, down in 24, all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Um, 26, this is David. This is a voice of faith. And David said to the man who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and take away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Yeah. And the people answered the same way. And then like Debbie referenced, his oldest brother. And this is doubt and shame from Satan coming in. <coughs> you know, and you know, Satan does that to us when we're going to stand for the Lord. And he says, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Putting him down making him feel small. In verse 20, 32, David's faith again. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. And of course, Saul to David, You are not able to go up against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth. And then David tells him what God brought him through. When Saul tries to clothe him in 38, with his armor, none of it fits. And David says, Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. My opinion, Saul wasn't really taking him serious. He gives him his armor. He knows he's a boy. I don't think anybody took him serious. He was a little kid. So David puts them off. But I think this is important because we're to use what God gives us and not let anybody tell us um, to do something or be something that we're not. David was going to be who he was and who God had prepared. So he goes out there in 43, and the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And this is faith tested again. In 45, then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And so he speaks his faith, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And that's the action of faith, and he does it. And what I like about this is when we study chapter 10, and we're looking at 9 and 10, this is what God is saying. He will defeat evil. He will defeat the rebellious. And then we see that David... He doesn't just walk over to Goliath. He runs quickly towards the battle. He's not afraid in 48. And then in um, 51, David runs again and stands over the Philistine and took his sword, drew it out, and cut his head off. And I look at that story and I think, this is a picture of God's man who is David, who is the victor, and Satan's man who is Goliath, who will be defeated. The Antichrist will be defeated. Um, and I read somewhere that David had five smooth stones. We can go back to chapters 9 and 10. That David had five smooth stones, one for Goliath and four for his sons. And he didn't need them for the sons. Those Philistines turned up their heels and ran. <laughs> and Israel, then Israel found their faith and yeah. pursued, pursued the Philistines. It's a wonderful story. And I know all of, uh, we teach it in Sunday school, but it needs to be taught over and over and over again because it is living out faith and knowing that we are going to defeat. We're go God's going to defeat the enemy. Okay, anybody have any comments? I actually Here. took my 
personal application from that. So I'm going to read this was my lesson in Sunday school last week. Um, and First Samuel 1737, I like the fact that Daniel, that, they, that David didn't take credit for killing the bear. He didn't take credit for killing the lion. It was God delivered me. And he said, God's going to deliver me when I go against Goliath. He, he didn't take credit for any of it. Um, he had learned as a shepherd and at, from experience that he could trust God. And so he went into this trusting God. Um, and the same thing with us is, you know, we learn these attributes of God and God, you know, we go through things and we learn more and more, you know, who God is. And then we can trust him when we face other circumstances because he doesn't change. Um, so, and then in verse 47, I like that he says, um, and God's going to do this so all would know that it was God's salvation. I love his great faith. Um, he didn't wear the armor that Saul had given him, but he went armed with his faith. And I look at us today, we have the armor of God that we can put on at our fingertips and um, at our beck and, you know, beck and call. Um, and we just need to use it. And I like, I like this, this thing with the brother, too. Um, I, I've been talking a lot with people about this. Uh, we have so much negativity and stuff going on in the world, and it's so easy to... Um, you know, I, I'm sure he was embarrassed because David comes. He's expecting to see this big battle, and they're just standing there, fearful, and his brother tears him down. Mm -hmm. And I think we do that a lot when we tear other people down to build ourselves up and to make ourselves feel better. Mm -hmm. And especially as Christians, we need to be building each other up and encouraging each other and edifying each other because we're getting beat up enough right. without doing it to ourselves. Right. Well, I think that's an important lesson, too. And any time you're going to stand for the Lord, Satan's going to use. And it, sometimes we let ourselves be used in the wrong way. But I'm um, going to use people around you or circumstances around you to try to discourage you and keep you from doing what he's called you to do. The other thing, too, that I think that I touched on is important to remember is God's given you a specific set of tools for weaponry that we're to use. And it's not the same for everyone. Faith is the same. God's word is the same. But as you see, David, David wasn't going to be able to wear what Saul had. He was not going to be able to be effective to use someone else's gift or talent or weaponry or whatever it may be. God's equipped him with just a slingshot was all he needed. Um, he had been tested with that, and he said, I've t he, you know, he had never tested Saul's uh, armor. He wouldn't know if it would work for him. But he used what he knew he had been. And we all have that. We have trials in life and difficulties in life that we know what our go-to is um, to find strength and, and to succeed. So it's a great story. Revelation 21 talks about Christ coming back and defeating the armies and letting the birds uh, feast on them, just like David said the same thing about the Philistine, letting the birds feast on him. It's the same picture. So... Okay, anyone else? Okay, what does the psalmist declare about the character and nature of God in these psalms? He's a righteous judge. Yep. He is most high God. Most high God, yep. Because all his works are marvelous. He shall endure forever. He is a refuge for the oppressed. He will not forsake those who seek him. He is known by his judgment. He sees all and will repay all. He's helper of the fatherless and he's king forever and ever. Yes. There's a lot of things in this short little chapter about the Lord. Okay. Anyone else? Have one they want to share? Karen? Um, he, did you say he defends against his enemies? He defends against his enemies. Um, I also have, he is known by his judgment. Um, he hears the desires of the humble, prepares the hearts, and causes ears to hear to do justice. His deeds are praiseworthy, and he is trustworthy. Yes. The part down here in um, 9 and 10 the Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. 
and those who know your name put their trust in you, for you, O oh Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. There's a lot of comfort in that and stronghold, and as you study the life of David, ran to many strongholds when he was running from Saul, and it was a place of refuge, a place of protection. So we know that God is our stronghold. David was singing that, knowing that, um, and that putting our trust in him, uh, seeking him, all of those things that he's given to us that we can lay hold of and have trust in. He's sovereign over the nations, worthy of praise. We see that in verses 1 and 2 and 11. He's everlasting and eternal in verse 7. He's our mighty protector and refuge in 9 and 10 and trustworthy in, in verse 10. <clears throat> all the things I'd want in my Savior and in my King. <laughs> so he's all of those things. Okay, how about chapter 10? Chapter 10. Okay, I have that he's omnipresent in 14, um, but you do see, for you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it in your hands to the helpless. To you the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. Um, he's sovereign and eternal. In 16, the Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. Um, he is just, in verse 18, to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, so that the man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. The man of the earth is the Antichrist, or the spirit of Antichrist, and he's defender of the fatherless and the oppressed, in 14 and 18, um, doing justice to the fatherless. You know, it makes me think about... Um, who we are before the Lord, before we come to know Him. We're a picture of this prideful, uh, corrupt heart, because He tells us that none are, um, none seek after Him, we're all wicked. We're all under the bondage of sin and death, but through Him we have victory. Okay, anybody else? All right, well, let's go on to the next question. So who are the righteous and how are they benefited by their allegiance to God? Righteous is put their trust in God. That's yep. who they are. Yes, they do. Okay, anyone else? Okay. So they produce the fruit and a desire and a capacity to live in obedience to the Lord. Um, the righteous in these psalms are those who have, have come to faith and are walking by faith and righteousness. They're not dead in their works. Um, somebody can say that they're righteous. They can dress righteously. They can proclaim righteous things with their mouth, but their works are dead. So a genuine righteous person. Uh, is going to be not dead in their works. They're going to be fruitful. They're going to be yielded to the Lord and following Him. And then they endure throughout eternity. They follow into eternity with the Lord. The righteous. Okay, in chapter 10, um, it talks a lot about the prideful man. Uh, before we go on to our next question, let's read uh, 10, 1 through... Uh, 11. Somebody want to read for us? Okay. Why do you, you said 1 through 11? Uh -huh. Okay. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. His ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he sneers at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. 
His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. He sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. His eyes, or he lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches, he lies low, that the helpless may fall by his strength. Hmm. Not a very nice picture. No, no. This is a picture of the wicked and kind of gives you a picture of their character and of their thoughts. In four, in the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. Atheism. There is a complete and utter rejection and disrespect for God. Um, it's as in all his thoughts. And we're dangerously close to that today. When there's no, um, no God to be just, no judging, and they've rejected him, they do what they want to in their eyes. There's no punishment. There's no wrong. Um, atheism, that mindset of atheism is, uh, is a picture of end times, a total rejection of God, um, and so arrogant in their uh, boasting and in their pride and in their arrogance. It does make you think of Goliath in what he was doing. He was boasting. He was arrogant. He was prideful. Um, you got to think about David writing this, having went through this time with Goliath and having seen, you know, hey, I've faced it. I have faced wickedness before my very eyes. And so, who better to write this? Um, and how did they lurk? And they wait, and they want to ambush, um, just like a lion. And that they want to devour the poor. This would have spoke to the Israelites because of their law and their understanding of caring for the poor. Um, and so, it's a very ugly picture, but a true picture. And we do see it today, really, really on the forefront today. Okay. Anarchy um, in the streets. I'm sorry? Anarchy in our streets. Yes. Yes. There is no regard for any kind of law or justice or... Um, it's, it's terrible. Okay, so who are the wicked and the nations, and what is their reward? Based on what we read, what you have? It's those who have rejected God. And their reward is that they will fall and perish. They will be rebuked, destroyed, blotted out forever. Even their memory will perish. They sink down, are caught, and are snared in the work of their own hands. They will be turned into hell. They will be judged and put in fear, and God will repay them. Right. Wickedness has to be judged. God is righteous and just and sovereign and he will judge wickedness. You know, now more than ever, we should be proclaiming that there's going to be a judgment. There is going to be a time of judgment. You don't hear that taught much. You don't hear people talking about that. They don't want to hear about hell. They don't want to be made to feel bad. They don't want to be convicted. And even in the churches, listen, there's a time and it's coming. And God says, there will be judgment. Uh, both individuals and nations who reject God will be judged. And that's what Revelation 21 talks about. He comes back on a white horse, and just with the sword of his tongue, he defeats all the nations. So it's a serious business. Um, the wicked cannot escape. And, you know, David writes this because it sure seems like they're getting away with a lot. Seems like they're prevailing. But God says there'll come a time when they will not prevail. And those promises are what we hold on to. It's our hope for the future. Okay, anyone else? I think it's really interesting in verse 4 how they all their thought there is no God. And we hear that, right? Like, oh, there's no, I don't believe in a God. There's nothing greater. But then in verse 11, he says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting contrast to verse 4 because it kind of reveals that idea that God is written on all of our hearts. Mm -hmm. And even those that try to claim, oh, no, there is no higher being. There isn't. 
they know. And so then it's almost like, well, they try to make excuses. Okay, well, there might be a God, but he can't see what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And it kind of reveals that. Yes. They might try to claim there's not, but even they know that yes. there's something. Right. They just well, it says, it. why does the wicked renounce God? Or another word is despise God. Mm -hmm. They despise him. They know they're not without the uh, the opportunity to accept truth. God doesn't deal that way. But it's it's excuses. But it's excuses. He won't see it. He won't call this to account. There won't be a consequence. Don't you hear that today? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've, I've gotten away with it for this long. Yeah. So over and over and over again, mm -hmm. and it's a real deception of yeah. the mind. It really just <laughs> it is. It's a deception of your mind. It's a way to convince yourself. They've convinced themselves. Pride does that. Pride does not allow you to be humble and see the truth. It does not. Um, one of the sweetest things in chapter 9, verse 13, Be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me, O you who lift me up the gates of death, um, that I may recount all your praises, that in the gates of the daughter of Zion I may rejoice in your salvation. We're already justified if you know him. We're already going to spend eternity with him. But shouldn't we, just Lord, please remember me. Be merciful to me today, what I need today, your mercy. And in light of where we find ourselves in our country in this time period, where it seems the wicked is prevailing, this is just hits, it hits home. But what a comfort in knowing that he's already won. We've seen the end. We've seen the battle. And he's going to win. Okay, we discussed the notation Selah in the introductory study and two appear in 9, in Psalm 9. What is the purpose of them in this psalm? The Rotary Study Bible says it may mean meditation or it may indicate the use of quieter instruments. Yes, yep. We've talked about Selah before, yep. And we don't know 100%, but you get a pretty good idea <laughs> when you read the Psalms, the intent of it. I think it's a moment to make you stop and really think about the seriousness of what he's saying. Mm -hmm. It's a really heavy, the Lord's judgment and the execution that will come, and, and it just seems to be this moment of, I don't know, just heaviness and recognizing just how serious mm -hmm. this is. Yes. In my Bible, I also have another word, Hegeion, uh -huh. meditation, uh -huh. is what mine says. Yes, mm -hmm. added meditation. Mm -hmm. I've never seen that one yes. that I can recall. So, if we read, uh, let's see, 13 to 16, I read a little bit of that, so let's go down to 15. The nations have sunk in the pit that they made. Um, in the net that they hid, their own foot has been caught. You know, that made me think of Proverbs chapter 1. Exactly. Doesn't it? That's where I was. Yes, yeah. yes. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. Mm -hmm. And so you have this Hagion Selah. So added meditation to stop and think. It's important for both men and nations to understand who their creator is, who their God is. And I think it's a time in this song that they were to stop and really think about those words. Mm -hmm. Take time. And it could have been a musical interlude. Could have a musical connotation to it. Probably does. Um, but, but the importance of responding in, in genuine reverence to God and to take seriously, I like what Kelsey said, this is serious, to emphasize the sovereign nature of God, speaking holy, reverent words. These are holy, reverent words. It's truth. It's a serious business. Pause because of the deepness of it. Time of true worship, especially re relating to his judgment, and it's not to be taken lightly. You know, I think when we worship the Lord in whether it's in prayer, whether it's in study, whether it's in music at church, whether it's in your own private music, you know, do we really stop and think about 
how reverent it is and how important God's words are and how holy they are and that we're taking it seriously. Um, and you know, when it talks about the nations have sunk in the pit that they made, in the net that they hid, their own foot has been caught. Yeah. I feel like our nation is doing that. Yeah. We are sinking into a pit mm -hmm. and we're going to get caught as a nation. I think it's very applicable to today. Okay? Okay. Well, I found that the word means one of the meanings forever. Oh, forever. For Selah or? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It means what? Forever. Forever. Oh, I like that. Yep. Lasting. Everlasting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, well, the last part of our study is a little more personal, but if you'd like to share, um, if you've learned anything or an application or anything that stood out to you or a question, uh, there's a lot in these two psalms, and everybody can come away with something different. So do you have something to share with maybe the Lord taught you or showed you? Looking at the sila and setting up all the, they did it themselves. You know, when they, you choose to disobey God, it's your choice. Yes. And looking at that, it reminded me of the importance to be still and know that I am God. When he said, be still, to myself, be quiet, think, understand, be fully aware, uh, unhurried time mm -hmm. to when you're, I'm in God's Word, what is He communicating to me? And to allow this unhurried, quiet time for the Holy Spirit to make clear what He wants me to know, about what I should be doing. Um, our lives are so busy, 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 got to do this, got to do that, to set it aside and see yeah. Be quiet and think calmly and meditate and, and uh, be I, clear. Yeah, clear and I thinking. think when you think about that word, Selah, there are times when you know it's time to just be quiet before the Lord. Maybe don't have an answer, or maybe that's part of the Holy Spirit that does that grumbling for you and, and those prayers for you. But don't you ever, there are times when you know I just have to be quiet before him because things are just that deep. Um, I think that's a gift from the Lord. It's a time of peace and refreshment. It kind of reminds you of the Psalm 23, the whole being our shepherd, and what a gift he gives us that we can reflect and have that time and let God grow us in that deeper meaning or that deeper understanding. When we quiet our own minds and hearts, and let him and the Holy Spirit bring to us what he has for us in that moment. And, you know, David being the sweet psalmist of Israel and the songs that he wrote, he must have been such a compassionate, poetic man. Even though he's a great warrior, some of these words you read, and you're like, oh my goodness. Um, God had really given him a true gift of... Uh, song and praise. Okay, thank you, Donna. Yeah, Sally. You know, that just makes me think, you know, God said that David, he's a man after my own heart. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's God's heart coming through there. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we know it's definitely his words, for sure. Yeah. I like when David starts, you know, in chapter 10, he says, why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? seems like that and he knows it seems like that but I love how David can express what we feel sometimes why does it seem this way but come back to knowing but I know that you're going to be the victor it's not this way he asks the question and relates in a way that we can understand because it does seem like it's really going to be this way and that there's no way out of it but we know that there is and he knows that there is Okay, anybody else have anything?
Cassie? Okay. I see you smile over like there. I've talked a lot tonight. Sorry. No, you haven't. Um, I like, and it's, I feel like it's a pretty constant theme throughout Psalms. His recalling of God's marvelous works, mm-hmm. and he is constantly, throughout other Psalms, telling Israel, "Go in the sanctuary and proclaim it. Like, tell it before all his people." And, and he even says it here that he asks, "Lord, deliver us that we may praise you. Lord, give us this so that we can." Um, and I just think it's a reminder to me of how important it is to go to him in those hard times, mm-hmm. but then to come back to him with praise. Yes. And I think how easy it is to do that where we go to God and we ask him for things and ask mm-hmm. him for things and ask him for things, and he does it, and we go, oh, awesome, and move on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and instead of, wow, look really what God did for me. Mm-hmm. And, and turning back that praise to him and sharing it with everybody around us. Look what God has done for me. Look how amazing he is. And um, we drill like saying thank you and gratitude into our children. But then how often we don't turn that back to the Lord. Yes. And just taking the time to thank him and praise him yes. for everything. Everything. That he's constantly doing. <laughs> and not just to let it hurry by, but like you say, to reflect on it mm-hmm. and think on it. Because, yeah. you know, he answers our prayers all the time. Yes. He really does. Um, and we're so quick to just overlook it because that problem's solved or, you know, I feel better or that's taken mm-hmm. care of or whatever it may be. And you're right. It's We really need to stop and thank him for what he does for us continually, mm-hmm. even when it's not the answer we want. <laughs> or he brings the things in your life that you don't necessarily want or wouldn't have chosen for yourself. Okay? So much for Yes, we do take a lot for granted. Yeah. Okay, anyone else have anything you want to share? Well, I will end then. I was just going to share, I wasn't here last week, but Psalm 23, as I was reading all of this, now Psalm 23 will always be the forefront and overshadow everything that I read in God's Word as His child. But one of the things, I watched a small video on um, a shepherd and his sheep. Oh my goodness, it was the sweetest thing. So I have to tell you this story. Um, He was out in his field and it was early in the morning and there was fog all over the field. You couldn't see five feet in front of you. But he goes out and he's calling his sheep and he has his special way of calling them. And you can hear them mm-hmm. in the background. They're way far off, and they're doing their bah, bah, you know, and you can hear them, and he's just calling them, and it's a little one. He's calling them, and you can hear them getting closer and closer. You can't see anything, but getting closer and closer. And here they start finally coming out of the fog. One here, one there, one here, and he's still calling them, and they get up around him, and they're so happy, and they're just jumping up and down, and they just surround him. I mean, they're just surrounding him, and he's so happy to see him, and he's petting him, but he realizes and knows they're not all there. So he keeps calling, and sure enough, here comes some more coming out, coming out, and he's just so happy to see them, and he's calling them, and then he starts telling them their names, saying their names to them, to the different ones. He knew every single one of his sheep, and he knew their names, and he was petting them and loving them, and he gets his backpack off, and he gets his food out for them and provides for them. And I thought, what a beautiful picture. You know, I thought, this is, this is such an impact for me, because how many times in life can we not see one foot in front of us But if we'll listen to the shepherd, he'll lead us right through that, right to his voice. We don't have to be able to see. They couldn't see each other. I'm sure the sheep couldn't even see each other, probably maybe even running into each other because they couldn't see. But what a beautiful picture. And not only did they know the shepherd's voice, but the shepherd knew every single one of them and knew if they were all there. I thought, what a beautiful picture. And so what a neat way to to think about our shepherd and what practical, everyday life things he uses to relate to us so that we can understand who he is to us. Do we have any historical background on roughly how large the normal flock of sheep would have been in that day? Well, I have some information out on the table 
that tells a little bit more about that. It's a, he studied ancient shepherds back in Israel or Palestine. And he does give a lot of information about that. But they would have been big because Job had, I can't remember, it says on that sheet, 21,000 sheep. And, but Job was wealthy. Job had a lot more. Just the average person. Yeah, they would have, I don't know. I don't know exactly how many. It wouldn't, obviously, wouldn't be as big as that. But a lot of them did have that and went into farming as well. Jamie? Yeah, I'd say around 20 or 30, because they used to, that's about how many, and they drive them along one person, they, they might have a dog. But 20 or 30, some are only 15. But uh, remember when Jacob came, At the uh, well. all the uh, shepherds came together to water them at one time, mm -hmm. and so, uh, it even references that yeah, in that was, material. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't say with all the yeah. shepherds, it wouldn't have been over 200. Yeah. Yeah. Nowadays, it's around 20 or 30. And then they always had a time when they sheared the sheep, and it was yeah. almost like a harvest time that they yeah. celebrated yeah. and had yeah. festivals. And it was just a very important part of their life. And I think it still is today. I think they are still quite a few shepherds today. Um, so it definitely is a would relate to them, most assuredly. Okay. Um, yeah, and that was one of the other things I mentioned. If you read that information on that, one of the neat things about that is, you know, David was the youngest of eight. And in that information, it shared that as the first son is born, he's the shepherd. And then the next youngest yes. becomes the shepherd. And then the next youngest mm -hmm. until the last one. And then they become the shepherd of the sheep. It doesn't get passed down from them because they're the last one. I thought that was so neat um, to see how they operate like that. That had a lot of good information. It did. Okay, next week, Psalm 11, uh, the confidence uh, that the faithful have, which is the next psalm. We did 10 tonight, 11 next week. Um, 37, why godless people prosper. That's a good question. Well, we are learning. And then 56, um, Troubles changed into gratitude. Three really good psalms to look at. If you have an opportunity, do the in-between psalms. They're just as rich and just as wonderful. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the precious gift of uh, the book.